good evening. Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we are discussing the issues that will be up before vote in November. And we have the candidates for Washington County 4 for the House. We have the state Senate candidates from Washington County. And we also have the sewer bond and we have the municipal growth, the proposed municipal garage. So we've got a lot of topics. We have a lot of shows. All of them are really interesting and you really ought to watch all of them. And today we have a candidate for Washington County 4, the House District. And we have Glennie Sewell, who is sitting right next to me. Well, hi. I appreciate you having me here this evening. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you being here. <laughs> with, all, with the schedule the way it is, that was amazing I could come. <laughs> Glennie, the schedule as it is, what do you do? I teach. I'm an adjunct professor of English at Norwich University. Um, I've been teaching there for the last two plus years and happily, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I truly enjoy uh, the process. I also occasionally teach for the Community College of Vermont. And, same, um, same topic. English. I'd, I'd, essentially, yes. You know, reading and writing for college, um, composition, those sorts of things. But yes, um, essentially. And I also have some, I have some outside editing jobs that I do as well, um, as well as um, other hobbies. Is this your first run for office? No, this is my fourth. What did you run for before? Both the same thing for the same thing, 2012, 14, 16, and 18 now. Now you're the standard bearer for the Progressive Party. Well, I wouldn't have worded it that way, <laughs> <laughs> but I try to do my best to, um, to push forward the progressive, uh, the progressive ideas as much as possible. Perhaps not every single last word. There's always a little bit of difference here and there that, you know, that you know, we try to debate on, but for the most part, yeah. What is the difference between the Progressive Party and the Democratic Party in, uh, in Vermont? Well, this is really going to be coming from my point Your of view, perspective. My, my own perspective. But for me, the difference is, first of all, complete clarity and complete um, transparency with the process that, that we're running in the government. The idea of not uh, of making sure you know where our funding's coming from, making sure that you're aware of who's in our in our pocket or not in our pocket of how we vote, why we vote, what we've done, who's paying us, who's not paying us, these kind of ideas, and that we're upholding the ideas that our Constitution um, makes high claim for. And that What would you know, some of those be? I mean, when we talk about um, um, pursuit of happiness, for instance, when we talk about Oh, you're talking about the U.S. Constitution, yes, not the Vermont about, Constitution. I am talking about the U.S. Constitution. I'm talking about the greater Constitution um, that covers all the 50 states. Um, to me that since most constitutions, I believe state constitutions, have to come off of that one, have to build themselves off of the, of the federal constitution, that we, do we need to actually follow um, the prescriptions that come from the U.S. Constitution and that people can be happy, uh, have a pursuit of happiness, health care, um, be able to support their families and um, not be run into the ground. Uh, to have education, most especially to have education available to them, higher education, um, not just, and, and I don't mean, f and I don't mean to ignore um, secondary education for, for, for children, primary and secondary, absolutely, that these things are made available and made available affordably. These are the kind of ideas that I, I push for, and to me there, there can't be um, an if or a but in those statements nor can it involve corporations that, that want to push their own standards without, um, without having the public know about what's going on. So, What's the number one problem in Vermont right now? Number one problem? Yes, sir. Healthcare. Accessibility or affordability? Accessibility and affordability, along with the second issue of higher education. In Vermont? How would we pay for healthcare expansion? We seem to be. If we're talking about we healthcare are, we expansion, we are, and we are. We seem to be. Well, okay, we seem to be putting more money into shipping nonviolent offenders out to other state prisons, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, than we are putting it into our healthcare system or placing it into our um, higher education system. We say that we don't have money, but yet we do actually have money. Uh, I truly do we believe we do. Where those areas are, I'd like to study that. Others have studied it. There has been an entire study done on higher education funding in Vermont. I saw the file for that, but I think that there needs to be more done. But 
um, there is a way, I think, of expanding health care without pushing out people who can't afford to pay two hundred and something dollars a month on 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 health care expansion. I most certainly myself couldn't afford that. There's got to be a better way and a cheaper way. Um, I certainly can't afford a little bit of monthly, absolutely. But there are people who are single and only have one job and a high rent apartment or home or mortgage, what have you, who simply cannot afford hundreds of dollars a month on, on, on in, uh, to pay into health care. And they still have to eat. They still have to rent, pay rent. They still have to pay utilities. And that money, extra money, is not coming in from anywhere else. Now, other states are experimenting with skinny health care. And skinny health care allows for insurers just to give basic minimum. Uh, uh, mental health is not covered. Uh, women's health is not covered. Existing conditions can be exempted. But the premiums are low every month, and it offers a bare-bones health care. Would you allow that in the state of Vermont? We don't currently allow that in the state of Vermont. No. Flat out, no. Because, first of all, mental health is not covered. Much mental of, the human, health would much not of be. the human race needs, needs work with mental health. Absolutely. Um, and I don't mean that as an insult at all. Everyone needs help with mental health from time to time, and that needs to be included. That needs to be an actual function of affordable health care. Women's health. I think it's time that we quit ignoring women's health. It seems to be absurd that we're even talking about it. It's like we're still talking about skin color, still talking about gender, still talking about all of these ridiculous things that, that are all portioned you know, part of the human race. Why are we still separating them out? Women's health needs to be absolutely included, it, not even as a separate thing. It is part of the health, you know, the health care that's offered. Anything under women's health, anything under men's health, what, whatever there is needs to completely apply. Otherwise, you're not offering health care. You're offering an aspirin, and, and that's all you're offering. This, this nonsense of skinny health care, if you cough, here's an aspirin, go out the door. That's all that is. That's all that sounds like to me. Now, if that sounds ridiculous, then perhaps it is. But it honestly sounds like it's an easy way to skirt... Um, the ACA and all the attempts to destroy the ACA, the ACA to remove its funding, the Affordable Care, the Act. Affordable Care Act, to remove to remove its funding by the latest administration, uh, it, latest the latest national administration, which I don't want to name, but the 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 the, um, the attempts to destroy that um, and allow insurance companies to once again count pre-existing conditions, um, I think that's um, atrocious, truly. Whoever people voted for, whether left, right, it doesn't really matter. All of them deserve health care, truly comprehensive health care. Now, if that means... How do we pay for that? If that means someone like myself or anyone has to pay an extra dollar or two dollars or three dollars or five out of my check monthly to put into a pot that allows that money to be used to pay for health care, then fine, I'll do it if it helps more people. No, granted, we have this, these discussions where someone says, "Why should I pay for that person's um, for that person's uh, fixing their teeth?" Or right. why should I pay for that? For that why shouldn't you? Are we not our brother's keeper? What goes around comes around. I know these are things people have always heard before. Well, I just want to be treated like I would treat anyone else. Well, then that's be that the case. I'm going to give for that. I'll give that extra five dollars to make sure the roads are fixed, to make sure the health care is out there, to make sure everyone has some sort of food on the table, even if, even if their income doesn't meet minimum standards. Did they get some sort of help? Something. It's not going to sink me by any means to pay an extra five dollars out of my check to, to to help out on these situations. It will not sink me. Of course, I'll pay for it. We want this quote free society, and we want you know all the things that we carp and caterwaul about in regards to our nation. But yet, we're unwilling to pay for it. I am not saying. Is there an affordability question in Vermont? Is Vermont yes. too expensive? Vermont Vermont can certainly be too expensive. It is. It's getting that way with renting. You know, this is what got me running in the first place in 2012, is when it comes to housing, just basic levels of housing. Now, I had called someone in, in Vermont about a year ago about the cost of brand new housing that was going up here in downtown, and the person said, well, you know, it's 800 and something dollars a room for a four-room apartment per room. And I said, why so expensive? So that's Chittenden County rates. 
but this is in Chittenden County, and that would price out people living right nearby and push them out of their homes. This is the same thing going on in larger cities like in California where I've been over and over, San Francisco and other places. This is a way of pricing people out and pushing them out. And I got into running originally because of housing issues, fair housing issues. So what would a know, fair housing issue be? A fair housing issue would be people living when I first when we first lived here, um, we lived in a location in South Burlington where not only was there mold growing in the bathroom, but there was lead paint peeling off the building itself. The building was not completely um, insulated. There was insulation work that had been done back in the 70s that was never completed. And that part of the building, 70s or 80s, and that part of the building was not completed. It actually was not sealed all the way up to the top. And work had simply stopped. And also the electrics in the building were 1960s to 1940s to 60s and yet it was always getting a pass by the fire department. And yet also, I found myself reaching through a window in the building to pop its, its, uh, to pop its electrical box so that it would turn, back, turn the electric back on, because from time to time, it would pop out across the entire building. And a tiny building, but it would pop out, and I would have to reach through a window into a utility closet and pop the, um, pop the electrics. They were old in that building. And again, the building was always getting a pass, and I always believed. Look, isn't it a local Arthur issue, Min not a state issue? That it needs. It, if it were handled correctly in a lo on the, at the local level, I wouldn't have had to deal with it. But if the, the state honestly needs to get into a situation where the electrics are not up to date, there's mold growing. There needs to be state standards leveled at, at these sort of issues, because I honestly don't believe that enough. There are enough people thinking about it on a local level to handle it. So the state needs to actually put out some sort of standards for that. When the state puts out standards, everyone thinks Act 250. Uh, what's your feeling on, Act 250 is the Land Use Act in terms of approving land use. Mm -hmm. Do you have feelings on that? I don't have enough feelings on it, but there needs to, I, I, I'm, in regards to Land Use Act, I'm, I'm completely a part of building affordable structures so that affordable homes, affordable apartments, affordable places so that we can get as many homeless uh, cleaned up off the streets so that they can have a place to start over so that they can get help finding jobs, finding work, and not be out here in the freezing cold um, begging for money. They should be able to, I mean, and I'd be willing to give money into a system that goes directly to helping them out instead of just handouts on the street. Do we spend enough on social services on the state level? I'm not really certain about how much we do spend on social services on the state uh, or level. Or the impact of, of state level spending, not the aggregate amount. Okay. Do you feel that the state has enough of an impact in the social service realm? Are social services sufficient in this state? I'm not sure. And see, I'd have to compare that to, um, to other locations in order to answer it clearly. But to be very honest, when we roll back to mental health, in that, st in, in that location, in that I mean, in that subject, I'm not sure we are as sufficient because I see so many people, again, who are homeless, who have serious mental, uh, mental issues, who are out in the cold. And to be very honest, I know we can't help 100%, but I think that we can get 99%. There's always going to be someone who wants to be out in the cold or who wants to live out, who wants to live off the grid. That's not. Those aren't the folks I'm talking about. I'm talking about the other 99% of the people who don't want to be outside and who don't who have problems, who are roaming around screaming to themselves and clearly they need serious help. And, I've, and, and, and like in the larger cities, I see people just walk by them or walk over them. And that's a heartbreak. That, that's a crushing heartbreak. And I, I, I really think that we can do better. Vermont likes to stand out as the state, as the state that's above so many. But we have so much further, so much, so much further to go in regards to um, how we act towards the least, um, the least of us, those that have the least, those that um, have the biggest problems, those that are out in the cold, those who are ignored on, on several, different levels, several different levels to include income inequality uh, and, and social inequality. How should the state be addressing income in, in, inequality? Uh, I think the state has been, has been addressing this with, with trying to push the minimum wage. Um, which hasn't gotten through the legislature and had a, a promised veto if it did get through the legislature. You know, so we need to, we really need to keep pushing because uh, I think the legislature has been working hard to try and fix that. I realize that the, um, 
the cost of living is actually going to push up over time as a result, and it would be might as it would be the same as if we were being paid seven twenty five ten years ago. I, I get that, but for right now, we still need to grow the minimum wage um, above what it is until we until we can get to a slightly higher standard. It'll help out some people. It will help. What will be the impact on small business, on small family business? I will, I'm hoping that the impact will would be would not be so hard at, if it grows over if the minimum wage goes up a piece at a time over a few years and to not $15 something you're right talking about. something yeah to something that isn't going to thrust them suddenly bring it up 50 cents then a dollar then over time slowly so that small businesses can adjust to that over time and see how it's going to affect them we can't do it all at once all of a sudden we jump up to $15 that's untenable and it would certainly damage small businesses. So my idea is the same as what the legislature has been doing by, by making it uh, incremental over the years up to what, 2020, 2022, somewhere in there. So I mean, I agree, I agree with that step. I don't agree with a promised veto because to me that completely works against the working class families of the state, completely goes against the, the lower middle classes of the state that are trying desperately to meet bills and how can anyone justify being able to veto that? So that's, that's, that, that's, that's my question to the governor. You know, how do you justify that? How do you really justify in, in vetoing an incremental um, uh, uptick in, inco uh, in basic income over the next several years? How do you justify vetoing that? Now, in the simple three minutes, we have three minutes to answer a, a three-hour question. How would you deal with school finance? School finance, I'm going to go back to what I had said about, um, about how much money we seem, because I don't have all the figures and I'm not going to pretend like I do, that we seem to be putting into nonviolent offenders and out being placed into out-of-state out of prisons. And the well, we of don't money, have the capacity you know, to place them I, I in realize, state. I realize that, but, I, but here's, my, here, here's what I've just said, nonviolent offenders, people who don't really need to be in a prison. So. Uh, we can find other ways to handle the situation with nonviolent offenders, but we put a lot of money into that that needs to that can go into higher education. Why are we forty? But when we're talking about primary and secondary education. That's, okay, so that, you're talking about primary and secondary. I'm, I'm education. talking about primary and secondary. I'll get to higher education right. in a moment. Okay, and well, I don't see why that can't still apply. Primary and secondary education should not be. It's it's a guarantee of the state of any state. So it should, there should be a set amount of funding and it should truly be a higher amount, um, a higher amount of funding. And again, we can take, take from places like prison and, and, and do prison reform in order, in order to make sure education actually gets it. If you can educate kids on the, lower, on the lowest levels of education, primary and secondary, you might not have issue with a lot of them going to prison at a later date. So we need to pump more into education and give them a voice, because not giving them a voice leads to a lot of trouble in our society. Do you feel that the number of school districts that we have, there might be greater efficiencies? What was your feeling on consolidation? Consolidation, I think, because I realize buildings have to be maintained. I realize it, it takes a great deal of money for school systems to maintain structures. and. And so in, in some cases, I think consolidation works, uh, bringing kids together in, in local areas, closer counties where they can go to school at a central point. In a few areas, that might be too far away and it might not work. I don't think it works 100% of the time, but I think that that's something that has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Some places can consolidate because their buildings might be falling apart and they, they're, they're, it's going to take way more money to, to, uh, to support the actual infrastructure where the schools are. So put them in a central but location. But wouldn't, you wouldn't get it class size at extremely small schools? Um, class, when it comes to class size, I, I would say for me class size is really important um, because when I was teaching, um, when I was teaching um, secondary education in middle school as well, um, the class size was about 20. Um, where I where I lived, and um, that was about it was fifteen to twenty, so that was about the maximum size that I thought a class. But in this particular take. case, people are talking about a class of four or five. We're talking about the state subsidizing micro schools. Okay, so and and to me that that's a whole another different issue because class sizes of four or five, that's I wouldn't classify that a classroom. That would classify that more of a um, 
it, more of a, a, a core conferencing than a, than a classroom. And that, that's done in college where you have small conference right. courses, which is what those are. Um, I don't know what the official name of them are, but it, that's more of an, and there is a word that's on the tip of my tongue about what those are called, but it's not actually a classroom per se, but it's more of a close conferencing. And again, I don't know the official name of that, but. But the question is micro schools, one through eight where you have 50 kids. Is it the state responsibility to maintain micro schools? If they are far enough out, like in the Northeast Kingdom and other mm -hmm. places where there's a great deal of distance between themselves and the next major okay. system, then yeah, I can see supporting those if they're too far away to be consolidated. I just, I can't. I can see supporting them, but not the whole state. If there are places where that are close enough for consolidation, one. Two, the, the buildings that they are actually in is, are, are not maintained very well, and the standards that those kids need to be, be given uh, uh, t you know, textbook standards, computer standards, good building. Um, and, uh, it's not hot in the in the in the early parts of summer when they're in school. Mm -hmm. It's not freezing when they're in winter. If those standards can be upheld and they're far mm -hmm. enough away from another from another centralized system, I say leave them alone. Would so, you finance some education on income or property? Say that again. Would you finance primary and secondary education on the income tax? Or the property tax? I would do it mostly. I would honestly d try a minimal amount on income tax. I would actually do it that way instead of on property taxes. I think that enough funding is, there's enough property taxes as it is for people to pay into education. I think a little bit more, I mean, like I say, a dollar or two a month out of a person's check going into a central system to, uh, to fund education. There's, there's enough already on property taxes. I've seen people that have to pay so much on property taxes as it is. At some point, there needs to be a cutoff on that. There needs to be a cutoff on how much you are charging people on the property that they already own. So there needs to be a percentage cutoff. Add a dollar or two to the, to the income tax, to income instead. For years, the progressives have talked about the tax system of Vermont and whether the tax system of Vermont is advantageous to the poor, middle class, upper class. Do you feel that our tax structure, our tax code, is what it should be? I'm not going to pretend to even be familiar with our tax code. I'm not an economist, so I don't quite, I'm not quite familiar with our tax code. That's why I became a writer instead of a mathematician. But, um, but from what I can tell from how other states operate to include our own, I almost never see what would be considered an advantageous tax system. Just for them being tax systems alone isn't advantageous. The very idea of taxing the population um, without reason, without reason on so many different things instead of just core things. Taxing a culture on their roads, on their schools, on their health care, minimum each because when it gets into the pot, that's a lot of money. Those are fine, but when you have to create a massive code um, it, it seems to be it seems to be shystering the population out of out of money that that, that that's been well made well deserved and is outside the core issues of again utilities education roads higher education those kind of issues those fine you don't really need a massive tax code for those but for a massive tax code for all these other issues I, I, I'm suspicious of that sort of thing when we speak of the state budget it's required by our constitution to be balanced and at the last legislature, at the very end, when we had surplus funds and it was discussed, we were talking about the pension funds and the pension obligations of the future. How would you square the teacher's pension fund that, that is just lingering underneath the surface mm -hmm. of, of the state budget? And, and when you talked about roads and bridges and the mm -hmm. like, our infrastructure. Do you feel that we've, we're spending enough on our infrastructure? We are only, I, I, from what I'm witnessing, it seems that we are only just barely spending enough on, on some infrastructure, roads are, that are slowly being worked on in the area, and that's just in the area that I can view where I am. I cannot speak to other areas of Vermont, but I, don't, um, I can't say whether or not enough is being spent on infrastructure. I just realized and noticed that it takes a while to get things done with infra infrastructure. In regard, again, in regards to, um, a teacher pension. Well, what if pension was actually is actually an agreement signed in a contract for teachers? Then the state is obligated to meet absolutely. That and the question pension. is, how do we meet that pension within our existing budget, with it lingering 
under the surface as more and more teachers retire and the, the needs grow. Um, you know, again, with the kinds of, um, like I say, when I said anywhere from two to five dollars, what have you, per month, just a piece of just a piece of, of that being cut up and placed in, in in the teacher's pension, I'm fine with that. Just like if it were a part of health care pensions, I'm fine. I'm I'm fine with someone wants to put fifty cents per person into the teacher's pension for all the st for for all the taxes that come through um, for education. Th that's fine. That that education, that little bit of tax for education, a piece of that needs to automatically be put into teacher's pension. That needs to be part of the rule. For where that tax money goes. Sure, it goes to books, it goes to computers, it goes to making sure the buildings are up to code and teachers' pensions and pensions for the people who clean up, who are who are mopping the floors, who are who are who are um, sec do secretarial uh, duties behind desks and who work in the library. All of that should be the things where these are broken up into, where everyone who works to maintain that educational system to its highest standard is actually made. We make sure we watch after them and pay that. I know that sounds all uh, that sounds all like tree huggy, but no, it's sounds like something that we, re we should require constitutionally, even state constitutionally. What about parental leave? Should that be mandated, that, that people should give parental leave in the state, paid parental leave? As in for, uh, for people who are about to have children? Yes, or, or yeah. people who have family medical emergencies. Oh, gosh, and the yes. Like. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, if there is a family emergency, then I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to, if I ever had children, then I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be there for my child. Everything else will get will get dropped temporarily while I'm trying to handle family issues, whether it's my mother right. or some future children or what have you, or my partner or what have you. That, those are the things that need to get looked at. That's family. Family, I even teach this when I'm teaching community college. Family comes first. If you're sick, there's medical issues, then that needs to come first. Class, class will come later. And I'll deal with that. But but blood is blood, or even non-blood families doesn't matter. It comes first. How do we pay for that? We have to figure. Or is that a private responsibility for people to take out insurance, private insurance, towards that? And we're going back to insurance again. And when it comes to medical, that when it comes to medical, uh, especially medical issues, that needs to be addressed under health care. That needs to be addressed under the types of health care that are offered, so that people can take leave, and that needs to be respected. A system that says, no, you can't take medical leave, of course you can. Why wouldn't you be able to take medical leave if you need to take care of someone if a child is being right, born? But should it be paid? Up to a point, yes. I would say that up to, up to a certain length of time, yes. What that length of time should be, I cannot judge. But yes, it absolutely How should How would be. you fund that? I can't be certain. Okay. I'm not certain of that. I won't even pretend to be certain of that. But we have to find a way to make that work. Now, I don't think it's going to sink the ship trying to figure that out. I want to walk you through a couple of hot button issues from the last legislative session. What, where do we go on marijuana from here as we decriminalized and partially legalized? What's the next step in your mind? We legalize it, period. How do we control it? And you, again, that's- Control it the same way you control tobacco. You know, yeah, do it the exact same way we do tobacco. The thing is, is that tobacco it, or liquor, to those, tobacco those or two, liquor. Yes, that, those the are thing two is, different systems. It's two different. We we have um, we have tobacco and liquor that that, is, that can really um, cause serious issues with with health far faster than 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 anything any damage marijuana can do. Uh, so the thing is, is um, if we figure, oh, we're going to have so so much problems, I'm thinking, yeah, well, we've had greater problems with alcohol and tobacco, and uh, and yet we've left those legal. And you can see what, what making those illegal did to our system. It, it created a massive criminal enterprise um, and, and, uh, back in the 20s and 30s, you know, when that was all, in the 20s, when that was made illegal. Do you feel the state has a role in regulating this? Well, the state's going to make it legal. Um, I'm not sure they have a role in regulating it, but they have the option to regulate it if they want to. But to me, um, go the way of California and legalize it for, um, um, legalize it for, um, uh, recreational. For recreational use from within the state. I'm not saying to do anything outside the state. People really shouldn't travel with it between state lines because that's still a federal issue. But insofar as insofar as just getting rid, not only getting rid of it as an issue in the state, but releasing people out of prison who you know um, grandfather who, who've who've been in because of marijuana, so we can get get that monkey off our back and stop having to pay for people who are 
you know, put money into people who've been in jail for nonviolent offenses like weed offenses. I'm not talking harsh drugs. That's, that's a whole nother thing that needs to be handled and also handled in a system that is not always penal. People who have hard drug issues need help. They need help getting off. They need the mental help. They don't need to be thrown into a prison um, for some sort of get back at that person for being a horrible person for taking drugs. Um, we're talking people who need help, who need treatment, weed, and these other issues c can be used in treatment, you know, and we know this medically. Prescription drug abuse mm -hmm. or opioids, what's your thought on that and the state's response to opioid I, use? I, again, this, this goes back to treatment. This goes back to, to the need for people to have treatment. Also, this, this needs to be addressed in the health system, in the healthcare system, where doctors are just prescribing pain medicine from the corporations, from the drug corporations that create them, because they're getting paid for it. That needs to be dealt with. And if the feds aren't going to deal with that, then the states need to deal with it, and that includes Vermont, needs to deal with, um, I, don't, I can't say that you need to penalize doctors who are pushing drugs, but something needs to occur to stop them from just writing out paying prescription medicines, because a lot of these folks, I would say the great majority of them innocently got hooked on opioids when, they, when, when um, one was a high school student who had a high school, he had an injury. And um, three or four years later, he was 17 years old when he had the injury, and I would say closer to four to five years later, he overdosed because he had been on the pain medicine for a long time, got hooked on it, didn't get help, and he accidentally overdosed one day. And the thing is, is that he had a legitimate reason for being on it when it started, but then, it, but then no one, especially the doctors, no one seems to care or notice because they're getting kickbacks and money from the drug corporations to push, um, these kind of, to push these kind of issues. And I know that this has been addressed in Vermont, but we need to look back at that again because we need to go to the source of, why, of, of, um, of where the medicine is coming from. We also need to go back to the source of mental health, of why this actually happens. Because putting a Band-Aid on this subject isn't going to help it at all. I assume in this, that you favored importation of drugs, of prescription drugs from Canada. Sure. If you need, in order to make them cheaper for those who need them, sure. Now that assumes the federal government will grant <sighs> the waiver that the state is of requesting. Of course, of course. In terms, I'm going to take walk you through one more social issue. Mm -hmm. In the last legislature, guns. Okay. What was your feeling on that? I had someone who asked me about this during the time I was signing up to um, to run, and um, uh, lives here in Montpelier in the area, and. Uh, votes, you know, doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't vote progressive. But I said to him, and I'm going to be honest, I said, that is still an open discussion. No one, and here's my view, no one's going to bust into your home and take your guns. That has never been the case. On top of it, do you understand, does anyone understand the level of resources, human and otherwise, it would take to actually perform something so impossible? And against the Vermont and against, Constitution. And against the, and against the Vermont and the federal Constitution. Right. To do such a thing, that's just how we're, it's a ridiculous fear that I won't approve of it by any means. But will I approve of people being able to buy tanks and, and massive amounts of semi-automatic weapons and clips? No. Why do you need that to hunt? Why do you need that to protect your family? But that wasn't you know? the issue in the state house. Right. So um, I, I actually do agree on, 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 on what the governor did sign. I actually do agree on... Um, on you know the amount of the clips, the type of clips that were banned. So I do understand that, but I'm not willing to. Uh, and someone says, "Oh, someone's going to bust in and take our guns." I'm thinking, "No, n not at all." What should should gun shows um, have to run have to run a check on people? Yes, absolutely. It doesn't mean they can't sell. Sure, they can. But yes, they need to run a check because we need to have mental health checks on on people who own them. But I'm not I'm not against the Second Amendment. I'm not against people having weapons. It's just that a tank is not necessary. Or a bump stock. Or bump stocks. Would you advance more gun legislation if you were sitting in the, in the state senate? That, that really depends on whether or not the, the gun legislation that's taken effect already is, um, is, is um, working. I'm not going to try and push in advance of more legislation um, without a study to see whether or not the most recent legislation um, is actually working. So not automatically, just out of nowhere, let's just push more gun legislation without reason. Not in a country that where, where guns are so much a part of the culture, 
but the thing is there's a different cultural response from different groups of people with when it comes to guns. Um, certain ones of us are not going to hear a gunshot and think, ooh, hunting and rights. Some of us are going to hear a gunshot and think, oh God, I'm about ready to be shot and I'm unarmed. That's the difference. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not about whether you have the right, but what, how do you respond when you see them? I have a different cultural response than other folks have. But again, I, I don't go overboard in, in regards to it, but I have, a highly, I have an entirely different cultural response to, to, to guns and, and what they mean because of how they've been used against different groups of people. Death with Dignity took several years to go through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same-sex marriage took several years to go through the legislature. Right. Act 250 forever has been going through the legislature in terms of changes. Right. Education funding every year. Did you feel that the process on guns was rushed? I think that it was time. I think that we always make the claim that, oh, the process is rushed, the process is rushed, but yet we seem to respond, we only ever seem to respond when there's a massive tragedy, like those happening in Florida and other states constantly. We only ever seem to respond. And sometimes we don't respond at all. Um, you know, we didn't respond to the, to the, to the you know, massacre at the gay club in Florida. No one responded to that. To that how, would you, how would you have responded to that up here? Um, the same way in which we respond, we don't have a whole lot of any of that here simply because we're just, Vermont's a small place. We don't have right. a whole lot. Um, people, people just go to any kind of clubs. They're not, they're not, they're not specified gay, straight, what have you. But, um, but what was done finally is, I think, how the response needed to be. Um, high capacity rounds, uh, bump stocks, those kind of things. Background and, you checks. Know, and background checks. And I mean, youth. Yeah. Say again? The final one was youth. Yes. Yes. So, um, in age. <laughs> right. So, yes. Um, but we needed to respond. But people don't, excuse me, people don't tend to respond um, unless it's children involved. And even then, the response is always, from other states especially, too slow. People don't seem to think it's a is big there deal. Is there something that's a pressing need right now that you feel should be addressed by the legislature that's not? Healthcare needs to keep being being addressed in higher right, but education. That's a continuing. Right, those, those are, are continuing things. I'm putting most of my focus on those continuing issues. Were you in the state senate? What would your policy focus be? What would what would Glennie want to see <laughs> done from sitting in, in in the Washington County seat? What would what would your what would what one area would you like to focus on? I continue to focus on those top two things instead of just one. The top two things that for me are kind of part of one another is um, health care and higher education. Those are always the two things that are sitting on my, because people, there are too many people who are aging out and getting sick. There are those who aren't aging out but who, um, but, but who are sick and desperately need help. And a lot of the time we tend to talk about so many other things but we don't ever really seem to focus enough on the people who desperately need help the most, most especially with health care. When we're in secondary education and a person gets out of Norwich or they get out of UVM or Middlebury, how do we hold them in the state? How do we keep them in the state as citizens? If we're going to keep them in the state, we need to get a hold of them shortly before, not shortly, I say a couple of years before they're due to come out. Um, or in secondary education, get them during their junior or senior year um, of secondary education, which is high school. So um, get them and, and try to see what we can do to lure them into job offer. I mean, actually say, we can offer you this if you, if you sign on a dotted line, this will be your job, your position, something that can be guaranteed legally to happen to keep them in the state. Otherwise, if you cannot offer them something that allows them to stay in, that want, allows them to stay in the state to be able to be paid a living wage, that's one huge thing that needs to be worked on is being paid a living wage. And um, if you don't offer these kind of issues, um, advanced training, uh, a, a guaranteed job, or at least a guaranteed stipend if the job doesn't come through, a stipend that lasts for six months that helps you find another position and find another place. If we don't make some sort of guarantees towards our students who are, who, who are already from the state and who live here, if we don't make offers to them and try to create some sort of um, guaranteed job system for them, then they're going to run from the state and they're going to run at high speed if we don't if we don't figure a way through this process and the state will get older and older and the state will get older and older so we got to try and keep young folks who are from here 
try and see if we can get them at least for a few years to stay here, for a few years to pump into the economy, for a few years, because they're going to want to explore and go outside the state of Vermont, and they should be able to, but also a number of people would, might come back. So the, uh, the, the idea should also be, let's put our feelers out and get people to come into the state as well. Um, there, I've, I've recently talked to someone about what to do to bring in other groups of people who um, other groups of people who don't exist in high numbers in the state, and I'm thinking reach out to higher education facilities in those other states and locations and to, to get people interested in Vermont. So, Glennie, thank you so very much uh, for, one, for stepping forward and running, and two, for appearing on the show. And let me say to you people that watching these shows is, shouldn't only be informative, it, it should be something that will walk you through the process of who these people are, there are outstanding candidates that are running, and I ask that you get out and vote on Election Day. I encourage your family and your friends to vote, and thank you so very much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me.